I'm always delighted to have on Outsiders uh, the Chairman of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. He's also a former SAS officer. His stance on China led to the Chinese Communist government locking him and his uh, colleague James Patterson from visiting China on a study tour and demanded that they repent from their views. Very very totalitarian, very Orwellian. During his army training, he had to endure a three-day extreme interrogation session involving constant sleep deprivation and starvation, and he still refuses to go on Q&A. But he always comes here on Outsiders. Great to see you, Andrew Hasty. How are you, mate? I'm well, thanks, Rowan. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. Now, our pleasure. Now, um, look, of course, you've been three times this week, the Global Times, that's the Chinese mouthpiece, uh, pretends it's an independent newspaper, but of course it isn't. It's uh, the mouthpiece of the Chinese Com Communist uh, Party have been attacking you, calling you a wolverine based on that uh, movie of Red Dawn in the 80s. Uh, why are they so upset with you? How come you've antagonised the Chinese? Well, that's a great question. Not just me, but also Senator James Patterson and Senator Kimberly Kitching. So it's a bipartisan yes. ticket they're attacking here. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, it, it reads a bit like the Batuta advocate without any of the humour. <laughs> um, but, but essentially, they're, they're unhappy about us standing up for Australian sovereignty. And there's a group of us. In fact, it's more than just three. I could list a whole list of names, but uh, we have more than 20 senators and MPs from the Australian Parliament who put their name to a letter last week backing in the foreign ministers of the UK, uh, Canada and, uh, and our own, Maurice Payne, in support of the Hong Kong protesters. Um, so it's a big number. It's not just us three. And they're just trying to push us around. And we're not for turning. And nor for repenting, uh, it would appear. Um, what, what do you make... When you first raised the issue of China about a couple of years ago, you were the first, along with James Patterson, raising concerns, you got an awful lot of stick from an awful lot of quarters. People attacked you from every side. All the lovies piled on in. Uh, you were demonised as usual. But pretty much everything you warned about then now appears to be accepted as being true. I guess, do you feel vindicated? And B, what on earth do you make of Daniel Andrews and this Victorian belt? Elton Road fiasco. Well, Rowan, my, my, my view is that uh, my job as a parliamentarian is to call it how I see it. Um, I did that. My colleagues do the same. And uh, if we cop incoming, well, that's part of the job. Uh, we're good for it. We can stand up under it. And uh, at the end of the day, our, our bottom line is sovereignty, which is why it's a bipartisan uh, move afoot at the moment to um, push back on uh, and protect Australian sovereignty. Um, as for Daniel Andrews, look, uh, he's out on a limb. He's, he's off the reservation, in my view. He shouldn't be making foreign policy. He shouldn't be entering into strategic arrangements, uh, particularly when he doesn't even have approval from DFAT. We saw their, uh, their press release on Friday afternoon uh, killing off reports, in fact, that somehow we, the, the, the Commonwealth gave tacit approval for, for them to enter into BRI. So he's all out there on his own. Rita. Well, he is, and we don't know how far out on his own he is because there's not much transparency around this particular arrangement. Uh, but it's not just the Global Times who've come after you calling you Wolverine. I think that's actually quite a cool little uh, slur if you've got to cop one. But your own paper, the West Australian, your hometown's paper, also did a bit of a hit piece on you. Can you tell us about that? Well, Rita, I've already... Uh said something on my Facebook about that and um, I was just standing up for myself and, and correcting the record. That's the beauty of um, social media now as the media market further disaggregates. Um, we all have a voice and I chose to use mine, um, my local paper. Do you, which do, is owned do by you think, yeah, do you think that it's that ownership of the paper that has motivated this unfair hit piece to try to malign you because of some random person posting something on, on Facebook? I, I, do you think uh, Kerry Stokes has been fairly outspoken about uh, wanting relations with China to improve and the importance of trade? Do you see a relationship there? Uh, Rita, I don't want to get into speculation. I'll, I'll take each issue one by one. It's a Sunday, it's a new week, and uh, I've said my piece on that one. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But that, I'll leave it to you, the commentators, to, to have a view on that. James. OK. I just wanted to change gears a little bit then. Um, 
As a military man and a strategically minded person, this Global Times paper is part of a huge propaganda effort around the world to basically attack absolutely everybody who China doesn't like, which seems to be to be just about everybody. So they've gone Brazil, they've gone India, they've gone the EU, they go countries around the world. It's not just here in Australia. Strategically, what do you think China's aims are here? Is this just really for domestic consumption to whip up nationalism within their borders? Because Looking at it, it seems to me that China is going to wind up with very few friends very quickly, and they're only accelerating the process of the world decoupling from the Chinese economy and Chinese supply chains. Can you give us any of your insights into this, having studied the Chinese issue very closely? Well, I think the Global Times serves as a propaganda mouthpiece for the Chinese Communist Party. And I think the intent in naming me, the Senators James Patterson and, and Kimberly Kitching, was to intimidate us a bit, uh, to make us go quiet, which we won't. Um, in fact, all it does is um, further, um, you know, harden our position, um, not in a bad sense, but in our, in our defence of, of Australian sovereignty. Um, it's part of a, a push to you know, effectively uh, whip, whip countries onto their side. Um, at the moment, the World Health um, Assembly vote, which passed the independent inquiry motion unanimously, uh, certainly would be worrying for them. Uh, you saw a whole group of countries coming together and saying, yes, we want transparency around the start of the coronavirus. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll target individuals who, who are speaking their mind. And I think that's just part of a, a global approach to information operations, which they use. Um, Andrew, in the, I'll just read you this little bit from, from the Global Times article about yourself, uh, uh, Kimberly and James. Uh, and this is typical Chinese propaganda. I'd like to get your thoughts on it. And it says... It asserts there are three reasons behind Australia's rising anti-Chinese racism. So they're calling it racism, what, uh, what uh, standing up for sovereignty is all about. And they say, to begin with, uh, white, white Australia has remained at the core of Australia's national identity. The country has gradually tilted towards the US to look for more social identification in being white. Second, many Australians believe COVID-19 originated in China. Uh, yes. And they may discriminate against the Chinese because they ignorantly believe it's the Chinese people who spread the virus. Well, nobody believes that. And third, Australia has always discriminated against Asians, especially Chinese. This is the Communist Party of China trying to whip up uh, race, race hatred. Well, that's, that's, that's a, you know, it's an effective way to attack people like me and others is to suggest that we're racist. Um, you know, put the, the lens of identity politics over the top of all of this and delegitimise our, our views, which are quite legitimately held. They're, it's ultimately about Australian sovereignty, which includes our strategic freedom of action, um, our ability to, to govern ourselves in accordance with our values and traditions, and uh, to, to pursue our interests around the world without interference from, from other countries. So there's nothing wrong with that. And to suggest that it's somehow motivi motivated by race is an effective way of attacking us. So, well, they've, cl they've uh, clearly learnt the identity politics of the left, as you said earlier. To what extent, Andrew, is the left wing in Australia uh, enmeshed with the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, is it a dangerous degree or is it purely an ideological? How, wh what are the links there that you see? I think the tools of political correctness can be used by anyone because, at, at the, in the end, political correctness is a way of controlling people. It's a, it's a means of power. And so if you can control what people say, you can control what people think. So, um, you know, it's not surprising that people with uh, authoritarian or totalitarian instincts use political correctness as a way of shutting yes. people up. And, and whether it's, you know, the, the CCP through the Global Times or, or, you know, a group of people cyber lynching you on Twitter, it's essentially the same means uh, to power, if you, want to, if you want to use that term. Rita? Well, Donald Trump's come out this week and terminated the US's relationship with the World Health Organization. What do you think Australia should do next? Of course, we've called for the independent inquiry, but should we be wanting some genuine reform at the World Health Organization as well? You bet. We, we, we've, we've been arguing for several weeks now that we want reform. I think that's right and proper, given the, the failure of the World Health Organization over the last few months, particularly with the, you know, the start of the coronavirus and its inability to prepare other countries for, for its spread. So, look, I'm disappointed that the U.S. is pulling out. We want the U.S. involved as, in as many global institutions that we are. 
um, because the US, I believe, is a force for good in the world. Um, we're going to stay because we're a regional power with global interests and we need to stay engaged through every mechanism that we can, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, you know, it's really important that we stay involved as part of our step-up. So uh, the US has their interests, we have our interests. Of course, we align on values and, and other democrat democratic traditions. Uh, but when it comes to the World Health Organization, I think the Prime Minister's made the right call there. James. This week also Donald Trump moved to pull the visas of Chinese students, graduate students in the United States, who had been connected to military universities in the United States. Um, we've seen some cases of worrying connections between academics from China uh, studying in Australia. Is there any move underway to do anything similar here? Are we concerned about... Uh, people, academics with links to these military universities, not civilian, but military universities in China coming here, possibly using our research for nefarious purposes or potentially committing uh, academic and other sorts of espionage. James, there's three principles I keep coming back to, which is sovereignty, transparency and resilience. Um, the, your question engages sovereignty and, and transparency. Um, where research in our universities is of national significance or it goes to our strategic um, interests. We need to preserve that and protect that. And I know Dan Pian, as the Education Minister, set some guidelines uh, for universities last year. But transparency is something we need more of in the university sector. A lot of money flows into our universities. Um, there are a lot of uh, relationships involving research collaboration uh, with foreign partners. And I think what the Australian people need to see is uh, where those relationships uh, begin and end and how they're being leveraged overseas, um, potentially against our interests. So my call would be, first of all, let's have transparency. Let's see where the money's coming from, where the research is going, and uh, then we can start making some decisions about uh, the, the future direction of our research. Uh, Andrew, you're the chairman of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, so you know your stuff about security and intelligence. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Outsiders last week said that if the situation arose where America felt that Victoria's Belt and Road deal was jeopardising telecommunications any, in any way they would simply disconnect. What, uh, what is your, as a military man, what, how foolish do you think uh, the Victorian government is being at the moment? Well, the good thing is that the federal government over the last few years has been doing a number of things to protect uh, our sovereign interests. Um, you'll, you'll be aware of the espionage and foreign interference legislation, uh, the ban on Huawei, uh, on Huawei, for our future 5G network. And we also introduced in 2018 the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act. So that creates a central register of all our critical infrastructure, which includes power grids, telecommunication networks, uh, water assets, ports and the like. So um, if Daniel Andrews was to include, as part of the BRI, one of those critical assets, uh, that legislation would be triggered and the federal government would be all over it. So I have confidence that we, we can manage this uh, but like I've said during the week, um, transparency is critical here. Let's see the paperwork that Daniel Andrews has entered into, put it out there. And I think the opposition in the Victorian Parliament and I think there's also potential in the federal parliament for, for committees to look more closely at some of these arrangements so that the Australian people have transparency. Andrew Hastie, thanks so much for coming on Outsiders and uh, great to see you. And uh, Outsiders fans always love to hear your points of view, particularly on our sovereignty. Andrew Hastie, thanks so much.